Je suis vraiment ravie euh, de voir ce rassemblement de la formidable communauté IRPP. Parmi nous se trouvent euh, les membres de notre conseil d'administration, euh, our board members, et tous ceux de notre équipe, sans compter plusieurs chercheurs universitaires qui sont des partenaires essentiels de notre travail. Il y a aussi des étudiants qui utilisent nos publications et y participent même. J'aimerais particulièrement souligner la présence de ma prédécesseure, Monique Jérôme Forget, qui est avec nous aujourd'hui. Comme la vidéo l'a montré, l'IAPP fête cette année son 50e anniversaire. Souvent, nous évaluons les organismes en fonction des ouvrages et des publications qu'ils produisent, des fonds qu'ils amassent et de l'attention médiatique qu'ils suscitent. Mais en définitive, les groupes de réflexion, les gouvernements, les universités ou les entreprises se composent de personnes. C'est des personnes qui peuvent faire une profonde différence en favorisant la réussite d'un organisme et par extension de l'ensemble de la société. Des personnes comme France Saint-Hilaire. Pendant 30 des 50 années d'existence de l'IRPP, France a tout mis en œuvre pour consolider la réputation de rigueur et d'accessibilité des travaux de l'Institut. Lorsqu'un sous-ministre adjoint ou une députée prennent connaissance de nos études, ils sont assurés qu'elles sont compréhensibles et fondées sur des données probantes. Cette exigence de qualité, c'est à France que nous la devons. En trois décennies, France a traité d'un vaste éventail d'enjeux qui étaient souvent l'avant-plan du débat public. Parmi de nombreux exemples, citons les travaux qu'elle a pilotés sur la diversité, l'immigration et l'intégration, le fédéralisme, la gouvernance dans le Nord canadien, le vieillissement de la population, population et l'inégalité des revenus. Et c'est sans oublier sa participation de nombreux événements, ateliers, symposiums, conférences et panels d'experts, ni les réseaux qu'elle a développés avec certains des meilleurs chercheurs du pays. Justement, une grande partie du travail de l'IAPP consiste ainsi à rassembler des gens pour éclairer le débat public. Et c'est dans cet esprit que nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui. Voici ce que disait l'économiste et homme d'affaires Ronald Ritchie dans le rapport qu'il avait rédigé pour le gouvernement en vue de créer l'IRPP, et je cite, « Il ne fait pratiquement aucun doute que dans nos sociétés modernes si complexes, l'efficacité des décisions politiques est fréquemment gênée par une compréhension incomplète de co des causes profondes des problèmes et par l'ignorance de l'ensemble des solutions possibles et leurs incidences. » Nos conférenciers Keith Banting et Deborah Thompson traiteront précisément de cette, in, cette compréhension incomplète qui entoure nos politiques publiques. Pour présenter nos conférenciers et le thème qu'ils abordent, je tends le micro à Alain Noël, professeur de sciences politiques à l'Université de Montréal, cet ami de longue date de l'IRPP, comme on l'a vu dans la vidéo, tient notamment une chronique dans notre magazine Options politiques depuis... Alain, on a dit 17 ans, 18 ans, <rire> de longue date. Euh, <rire> ses travaux portent sur les politiques sociales, le fédéralisme comparé et plus largement la vie politique canadienne et québécoise. À toi, Alain. Merci, Jennifer. Euh, avant de commencer, je vais être bref, euh, mais euh, comme euh, Monique Jérôme Forget est ici, euh, je voudrais saluer le, le, le fait que je pense, pas me tromper, je ne suis pas un spécialiste de l'histoire de l'IRPP, mais je pense pas me tromper en disant que si l'IRPP est installée et bien ancrée à Montréal, c'est grâce à Monique Jérôme Forgette, c'est elle qui a installé l'IRPP ici et fait en sorte que ce soit la demeure de l'IRPP durablement à Montréal et on, nous en profitons tous. <rires> Et comme ce sont les 50 ans de l'IAPP, je n'ai pas été là pour les 50 années, euh, mais ça fait quand même un bout de temps. Et euh, j'en profite pour... Euh, je suis toujours content de remercier euh, les gens à, à Options politiques, euh, à l'IAPP, de m'avoir offert pendant toutes ces années une plateforme formidable pour euh, écrire et réfléchir avec euh, ce que je pense être mes lecteurs imaginaires, qui sont toujours les meilleurs. Euh, et... Euh, tout ça sans avoir à se soucier de Reviewer 2 qui euh, euh, intervient toujours dans les publications académiques. Euh, 
donc, euh, pour moi, l'IRPP, c'est un peu une, une, une maison un peu à laquelle j'appartiens. Euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, pour célébrer les 50 ans de l'IAPP et également un peu en reconnaissance euh, de la contribution de France saint hilaire qui a été sa, la vice-présidente, une vice-présidente qui a duré beaucoup plus longtemps que les présidents d'ailleurs, euh, de l'IAPP pendant plusieurs années, euh, nous avons une présentation faite par Keith Banting et Deborah Thompson. Euh, je vais être très bref dans les présentations, ils sont bien connus. Euh, Keith Banting est Stauffer Dunning Fellow et professeur émérite à l'Université Queen's en sciences politiques ou euh, gouvernement. Euh, ses travaux portent sur les politiques sociales euh, et avec un intérêt particulier pour la solidarité sociale dans les sociétés diverses. Euh, Keith Banting est membre de l'Ordre du Canada et membre également de la Société royale du Canada. Euh, pour moi, Keith Banting, c'est aussi un modèle euh, et un, un, un bon collègue. Euh, je, si j'avais un conseil à donner à un jeune chercheur, je dirais, trouvez-vous tôt dans votre carrière un Keith Banting pour être en désaccord avec, euh, pour euh, nourrir euh, des débats, pour des, des débats riches et euh, fructueux et agréables pour euh, de nombreuses années. Euh, avec Keith Banting, on a discuté euh, de politique sociale sur plusieurs, euh, à plusieurs occasions avec toujours un grand bonheur. Euh, Deborah Thompson, qui euh, travaille depuis quelques années déjà avec euh, Keith, euh, est professeur agrégé à, en sciences politiques à l'Université McGill depuis relativement peu longtemps. Euh, elle est titulaire de la Chaire du Canada sur l'inégalité raciale dans les sociétés démocratiques à l'Université McGill. Et ses travaux portent sur la race, l'État et l'inégalité au Canada et dans les autres démocraties avancées. Son plus récent livre, euh, The Long Road Home on Blackness and Belonging, va paraître euh, en septembre euh, cet automne chez Scribner Canada. Euh, ensemble, Keith et Deborah ont... Euh, réfléchit, euh, il y a déjà des, des travaux qui sont parus sur cet enjeu et ils vont en parler aujourd'hui, euh, sur euh, les relations entre l'État-providence et les inégalités raciales au Canada et je leur laisse la parole. If all of to start, And I want to start by thanking IRPP for inviting Deborah and me uh, to uh, participate in this uh, celebration of France and this celebration of IRPP's 50th. Uh, I want to thank Alain for that very generous introduction. Alain and I have been engaged in debates about federalism and social policy for most of our careers. And um, the, the debates have been uh, deep and enriching and uh, illuminating. So I want to thank. Uh, I want to thank uh, IRPP personally for inviting me because I have known France a long time uh, and have worked on a number of projects with her and came to admire her um, and to respect her judgment on so many issues uh, and even to appreciate the very fine-tuned editorial pen <laughs> uh, which she wielded and she could always find the, the areas where I wasn't quite clear what I was saying. Um, <clears throat> so there's a natural tension between editors and, uh, and authors and uh, she played the role brilliantly. So uh, today, um, Deborah and I want to talk about uh, or build from a recent paper we published Uh, and um, in doing so, we hope to open up an area of conversation and perhaps even provoke a little. So <clears throat> our starting puzzle, if you will, or question, or curiosity, is that um, Canada is marked by the persistence of considerable racial economic inequality. Uh, despite the fact that we have built a complex architecture, policy architect architecture since the Second World War, um, we built a welfare state, perhaps not the most ambitious one, but a respectable welfare state. We have universal health care, 
We have race neutral immigration. We are an international leader in multiculturalism. We have a charter of rights and freedoms, which is a distinctive modern charter, which includes exemptions for affirmative action programming. Despite all of this, it is clear that there are persisting racial economic disparities across multiple generations. It's not a problem that's disappearing. <clears throat> what is also interesting to us, more interesting to us, in fact, what we're going to concentrate on, is that this reality of racial dis economic disparities has not emerged as a central driver in our politics. It has not emerged in the restructuring of social programs that we've gone through in recent decades. And so our question is, why not? Why have we not engaged with this issue more directly? So <clears throat> my first task, and I apologize, um, this is totally unreadable. I should have turned it into something more elegant, but couldn't. Um, and so let me just tell you a few things that I think uh, emerge from this. So um, over 30% of racial minority populations would live in poverty based on market income alone. And for other groups, the number, and for some groups, the number approaches 50%. The tax transfer system does work in redistributive terms. There's no question. The problem would be greater if we're not for the redistributive structures that we do have. But the, these structures reduce poverty more for the rest of the population than it does for the racial minority population. These are numbers here. I apologize, anyone can have the slides if you're interested. Um, and there are obviously significant differences among racial minority groups, with the problems of, being, of persistence being most marked among uh, second and third generation black, black community, Arabs, and West Indians. Um, there are uh, significant differences, um, I'm sorry, I've already said, uh, persist through the third generation. And one finds similar patterns. We could have talked about differences in wages. There's similar sort of evidence there. <clears throat> Excuse me, precarity or precarious income and uh, precarious employment. Health, I don't need to belabor the differences in health and health outcomes which were so graphically uh, illuminated by the pandemic. And there are differences in wealth. Uh, we have less effective data in Canada on disparities in wealth. I note that in the United States, <clears throat> disparities in wealth is rapidly becoming one of the central foci of debates over racial economic inequality, building a case towards, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, towards reparations. So, um, having set that tableau, the question then becomes why? And I'm going to let my colleague do all the heavy lifting theoretically. So those are the basic facts. And the questions that Keith and I seek to address in this paper and in our broader work uh, are twofold. First of all, why is it that Canadian policies don't address racial economic equality, inequality more directly? And secondly, why is it that racial economic inequality hasn't emerged as a more central feature of our policy debates? And we answer these questions in two parts. So first of all, if you're looking at the, the frameworks and the problem definitions and the policy tools that have been developed since the post-war era, particularly that era from after the end of the Second World War to about the 1980s, we argue that those policy regimes were never actually intended to address racial economic inequality directly. During this period, the Canadian population was, frankly, overwhelmingly white. If you look at the 1981 census, Canada is 96% white, even as cities like Toronto and Montreal have seen incredible uh, changes in our demographics on the whole, the country is, is still largely of European descent at this point. And these policies were largely created both by and for a European descended electorate. But in the 1990s, Canada uh, increasingly diversifies rather rapidly and racial economic inequality becomes more evident and increasingly inappropriate given the normative egalitarian discourses of the era. And yet, 
racial, economic inequality is still not addressed in our policies. All core government programs, virtually all core government programs are retooled in some way during this era beginning in the 1990s, but not in a way that pays attention to racial economic inequality. So why? The answer that we have uh, is about the role of ideas, path dependency, and policy drift. So we contend that the universalist norms that we inherited from the post-war era were deeply embedded in our policy architectures. And these norms tend to render both race and racism as either incidental or antithetical to the operation of Canadian liberalism, that's small l liberalism. So in effect, we're making an argument about path dependency, the ways that policy choices from the past help determine what options are viable in the present and the future. Scholars have also used the concept of policy drift to refer to the ways that agents might actively choose not to respond to environmental changes or the ways that those agents are purposefully obstructed from responding and putting policy changes into place. Instead of talking about policy drift in the paper, we talk about something we call policy inertia, which results from institutionalized ideas and ideologies that tend to frame problems in particular ways that reflect the past better than the conditions of the present. So it's not that actors are choosing not to respond to new conditions or that they're being actively blocked from making changes, but rather it's these universalist principles that underlie Canadian liberalism that frame policy problems in ways that just aren't conducive to direct attention on racial economic inequality. And we trace this argument through four major policy regimes. Uh, Keith will begin with our first two. So we start with the structure of the welfare state. Um, there's no question that the welfare state that Canadians built in the post-war decades made Canada a fairer place. There's no question that racial economic inequality would be greater if those programs did not exist. Reflecting Canadian universalism, racial minorities were incorporated into our, lar our large social programs relatively straightforwardly on a colorblind basis. <clears throat> there, are, there were some temporary restrictions for people who had come to Canada, particularly in the pensions area. But by and large, <clears throat> racial diversity was not a significant part of the framing or the structure of the debate in the post-war era. Now, this actually may be a good thing because in the post-war period in the U.S. and in subsequent decades, race did was a central part of uh, the politics and social policy, and it was a negative force, a toxic force, running through the politics of social policy development in that country. That has not been true in Canada. By and large, um, our welfare state programs have operated on a universalist basis, on an te te teaching people, sorry, treating people as individuals in a colorblind way. That was the basic approach to public policy that we inherited from the post-war era. And what is interesting is that although those post-war welfare programs have gone through several cycles of restructuring, um, the politics of race and the particular issues of racial economic inequality have not emerged as a central part in those big rethinks of our social policy. So we went through a cycle of retrenchment in the 1990s and the 2000s, and I would argue the politics of race paid very little, uh, played very little role in that uh, process of retrenchment, unlike some other countries where racial tensions around immigration did con were conducive to cuts in, in welfare programming. But in the Canadian case, um, the issues were framed in a universal language of generic workers and generic families, Social investment was the discourse that was used in that period. Some called it the human capital model. And it was an argument in favor of moving away from redistribution and income transfer programs towards human capital. And in that, there was an acceptance that there were certain groups that would be very vulnerable in this kind of transition. But when you look at the groups that were defined as vulnerable, they were single mothers, Aboriginal peoples, people with disabilities, and 
recent immigrants. The idea of that racial minorities who have been here for some time might be particularly vulnerable to these transitions, and they were uh, vulnerable to the cuts that followed, was not part of the discourse. The whole, uh, you can work through the documents of that era with considerable attention and not find a re reference to race and racial inequality. Since then, since 2015, we've gone through an expansionist phase in our social policy. It's actually quite striking how many new initiatives there have been in social policy. Child benefits in 2015, uh, 2015 the rolling out of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of um, child care, expansion of the Canada Pension Plan, increases in GIS, uh, work on long-term <laughs> long residences, uh, a disability benefit just introduced, perhaps dental care. This has been an expansionist period, relatively uncelebrated for reasons I don't fully understand, but an expansionist period in our social politics. The politics of race, the particular position of racial e economic inequality and racial minorities has, been, has not been part of the case for expansion. Let me give you an example of child care. <clears throat> Probably the program which helped uh, racial minority families most. Child care was introduced on a purely universal basis, helping middle income uh, families generally. Um, the Liberal Party published a fascinating nine page document on what they meant by the child benefit program and how it would operate, very detailed, by the standards of most uh, party documents in an election context, very sophisticated. The word poverty does not appear. The language is helping the middle class and those working hard to join it. And certainly there's no reference to this being a good policy because it might help reduce the gaps in racial or the extent of racial economic inequality. So the welfare state has gone through multiple cycles, but we've not actually focused our attention on the implications for <coughs> racial, uh, racially, uh, economically um, limited racial minorities. Now the immigrate, I'm, how am I doing for time? <laughs> We're good, okay. Go! <laughs> now the second field, so that was the first field we look at, policy domain. Second domain is immigration policy. The part, um, oh thank you. You're welcome. I'm forgetting the slides. Uh, so immigration policy is a perfect example of the, <coughs> of the move to liberal universalism in Canada. It was a period in which we finally removed explicit uh, references to race. In the, we introduced a point system, which was, in effect, the operationalization of liberal universalism. And in the early decades, this uh, was a very successful program. Immigrants uh, came. They in, in, integrated relatively effectively. The poverty rate after 10 years was lower for immigrants than it was for the population as a whole. Uh, this uh, regime, however, began to stall. The integration regimes began to stall in the 1980s and 1990s, precisely when Canada became more racially diverse. And here we had new immigrants coming with high skills, uh, but they were um, unable to utilize those skills effectively and, there were low and faced lower relative incomes compared to their predecessors. Poverty rates in between 1980 and 2005 went up for immigrants and down for the Canadian born. We went through a major period of restructuring. Governments took this problem seriously. The fact that new waves of immigrants were not integrating effectively into the labor market. Throughout this process, they framed the problem as an immigration policy problem, not a racial inequality problem. And so the debate was about foreign recognition of credentials. It was about language skills. It was about the extent to which workers needed Canadian experience. I don't know how many debates and workshops I went to in that period where the same list of factors were presented as explaining the problems. Never did anyone suggest 
that maybe the problem had to do with racial discrimination in the labor market. That was never one of the factors on the list. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if, they, if uh, the immigration authorities even had believed that word, that was a major <coughs> problem. It's not, it wasn't an immigration policy domain. Immigration departments did not have the tools that would have allowed them to tackle racial economic inequality more generally. They deal with immigrants who are, uh, until they became citizens, become citizens. But after that, immigration authorities have no place. So not surprisingly, our immigration authorities fell back on traditional tools to deal with the problem that was emerging. They shifted from worrying about the integration side to the admission side of their portfolio. <clears throat> they gave much more <clears throat> stringent, <clears throat> I apologize for my voice. Um, I'm talking too much maybe. Uh, so they um, ad <clears throat> adopted much more stringent language testing programs for people who wanted to immigrate to Canada. Uh, they uh, raised the standards in a number of areas, and in, most importantly, they said pre-existing offer of employment is going to be critical increasingly. So the issue was always framed as an immigration issue. It was never seen as a racial economic inequality issue, <clears throat> never framed as a problem potentially of racial discrimination beyond the immigration phase of people's lives. Over to my calling. Just in time. I know that you're all thinking, but multiculturalism. So let me talk about that for a few minutes. Uh, Canadians and especially Anglophone Canadians have come to embrace multiculturalism as an integral part of our national identity. But let's be clear, uh, the policy that was created in 1971 was never about the integration of racial minorities into Canadian society. Uh, and since 1971, the policy has evolved in really important ways. And the consistent thread of this evolution has always been the equality of cultures on the one hand and the politics of recognition, which I like Charles Taylor wrote about on the other, rather than wealth, income, or economic equality. During the 1980s, uh, some funding did in fact go to local initiatives to counter racial discrimination but by the 1990s and increasingly into the early aughts, the orientation of multiculturalism policy <laughs> shifted to a more explicit focus on integration. And here in Quebec, where multiculturalism has always had less traction, public debates continue to swirl around the reasonable accommodation of religious minorities and debates over secularism in the public sphere. So on the whole, the multiculturalism policy, which we value so much, reflects the historic centrality of ethnicity, culture, and language in Canadian politics. And as a result, critics, myself included, worry that multiculturalism has, in fact, just worked to convince Canadians that we live in a tolerant society and that racism is only something that help happens somewhere else or it's something that happened long ago, thus deflecting attention away from the realities of systemic racism here and now. The crowning achievement of Canadian post-war liberalism was undoubtedly the entrenchment of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has been undeniably successful at providing redress against a number of discriminatory state policies. But we argue that the Charter and the wider rights regime really have not worked to challenge the economic dimensions of racial inequality. So for their part, the courts have taken a relatively guarded approach to the idea of social rights. And as a result, anti-discrimination provisions provide no guarantees of racial economic equality, sorry, of racial equality on economic terms. Human rights commissions that exist at both the federal and provincial levels do extend protections to, uh, against racial discrimination in private spheres, in areas like employment and education and housing, but the models are all reactive, they're complaints-based, and they focus on retroactive redress for individual human rights violations. And therefore, those regimes are fairly limited in their ability to tackle what is a systemic issue, that is, racial economic inequality. The more relevant uh, policy that we have yet to mention is, of course, the Employment Equity Act, 
Uh, and here we have a partial exception to our argument. In theory, the Employment Equity Act could have worked really well to address racial economic inequality, but the policy is limited in several important ways. As we know, the legislation only applies to federally regulated industries, which together is about 10% of the Canadian workforce. Similar legislation that exists at the provincial level is remarkably, uh, remarkably um, uneven, which means that most employers in Canada are in fact not covered at all by the legislation, though this is partially mitigated by the federal contractors program. So while the employment gap over the past 35 years between men and women has dissipated significantly, the same is not true of the underrepresentation of Indigenous peoples, uh, persons with disabilities, and racial minorities, including in the federal public service, where one would think the Employment Equity Act would work best. <clears throat> So we should mention, of course, that the policy is currently undergoing a review that is being led by my colleague, Adele Blackett. And so time will tell whether or not it can be retooled uh, to have stronger policy goals and include stronger enforcement mechanisms. So we are now almost exactly two years out from the largest mass uprisings we've ever seen in North American history. Um, and we have some evidence that over the past two years, uh, these entrenched ideas of universalism that we argue that we that we argue about in our paper are shifting at the edges. Over the past few years, we've seen some initiatives that specifically target racial minority groups, including the creation of the Anti-Racism Secretariat at the federal level, the PCO's call to action on anti-racism, equity, and inclusion in the federal public service, and efforts to address anti-black racism and anti-racial, sorry, anti-Asian racism, and also renewed calls and some initiatives, including those at the provincial level, to collect racially disaggregated data. And so we find these developments promising, but there's also a good reason to be skeptical. And to be fair, I, I think that I'm probably more skeptical than Keith. Um, racial progress has always, without fail, been marked by a disproportionate backlash. Uh, and I think it's safe to say that we are at the beginning, not the middle, and not the end of that backlash now, as evidenced by the truckers' convoy, uh, the use of woke as a disparaging slur, and also the limited reforms we've been able to make in any area of criminal justice. Moreover, we note that many of the initiatives that were designed, that, that seem designed to address racial economic inequality, have been put in place rather quietly. We wonder if this kind of reform by stealth can really initiate the kind of substantive change that's required to achieve racial inequality in either our or our children's lifetimes. Okay, so time to uh, bring this together. <clears throat> our puzzle was actually kind of simple when you state it. Why have we met, not made more effort to reduce racial economic inequality in Canada. Now, to be, you know, we, we accept upfront racial inequality would be worse without the social programs and the universal structures that we have been discussing. And some racial minorities have made major progress, no question. But stability and poverty rates against, gen, across generations for some racial minorities is actually deeply embarrassing given what Canadians tend to think this country's about. Our answer is that this is a, not a simple local recent problem. It's built into the structure of our public policy and our political institutions. The post-war social programs were designed for a different country. They embedded deeply the story of a universal uh, approach to public policy. It was a period in which we delegitimated race as a category in policy and pol political debate. It was not the way we would handle issues. And as a consequence, we built into our institutions, into our structures, into our ideas, and into the toolkits we have given 
uh, in, um, government uh, decision makers, we institutionalized a set of ideas and tools which have tended to deflect attention away from racial economic inequality. By delegitimating racial categories and governance, we, we, we perhaps saved ourselves from a lot of big nasty problems, but we also deflected attention from uh, an ongoing inequality that matters. <clears throat> so, one of the things I want to make clear uh, is the relationship of our answer to racism. We do not deny that there's real overt racism still in Canada today. But our argument does not depend on that. Our argument does not turn on racists doing racist things. Our argument turns on the idea that we have from the post-war period embedded certain approaches to public policy in the way in which we organize ourselves. And that is in effect almost a, a, a textbook definition of structural raci racism or institutional racism. So it's not the people who've been doing, in government have been doing nasty things. It's that the uh, inherited way of framing issues and the inherited toolkits don't direct attention to what has become, uh, I would argue at least, um, an embarrassment that has yet to be challenged. Now, how would one move forward? Well, clearly in the, simple, the simplest way to move forward is actually to use the toolkits with, uh, which are um, framing um, facilitates. So there's no question that if you wanted to reduce economic inequality in Canada, generally through an enhancement of redistributive programming, that would help poor racial minority families and children. There's no question. If you go that way, if you could generate enough energy, you could make progress. But we are <clears throat> skeptical that you would be able to do that, make real advances on racial economic inequality by that alone. We suspect deeply, I, I, I probably, I, I think equally de deeply, uh, <clears throat> that more targeted economic instruments would be required. Now, we're not prescriptive in the paper, and I'm not sure if you ask us what should be done, we would have a coherent answer. But we're convinced that continuing to rely on a universalist conception of Canadian society and Canadian public policy on its own will not respond to the real economic challenges this country faces. Thank you. I have many, many, many questions and comments and suggestions, and I'm sure we could debate these I think we will probably, time permitting. But uh, my question is the following. Um, you, in, in your presentation, you contrast, in a way, you, you contrast a universalist approach uh, which delegitimizes race. And it, even we could say you didn't say it, but it, well, it was implicit that delegitimizing race was seen as a progressive thing to do, uh, as uh, being blind to race was a way to avoid racism and to de deconstruct old racism by saying we're, we're beyond that. Uh, but uh, I want to take you somewhere else. Um, racial inequality is a subspecies or could be seen as a subspecies of a broader type of situations that we could call, or Charles Tilly calls, categorical inequality. Inequality is between categories of people. Uh, they can be uh, defined by race, but they could be also Catholic and Protestants, or Francophones and Anglophones, or men and women, and so on and so forth. And uh, in the Canada's universalist model, we have addressed uh, very explicitly, at least two important uh, 
categorical inequalities. The first one was mentioned by Deborah is the uh, inequality between men and women. And uh, the second one uh, is the inequality between Francophones and Anglophones, uh, which was uh, particularly important in the politics of Quebec. Uh, in addressing these inequalities, we have gone beyond this sort of blindless universalism that is suggested by Keith. Uh, we have been aware of some inequalities of a categorical nature. And my question then is, what can we learn from what has been achieved? Because much has been achieved. Uh, inequality between men and women is not uh, perfect, but it's better than it was. And French-English inequality in Quebec is basically a story of the past. Uh, and so major progress has been accomplished. And perhaps there are things we could learn, perhaps with race we cannot do the same way. Or perhaps we could. I'm just turning the question to you. Do you want to start? I, I can. I mean, I, I, think you're, I think you're absolutely right. I think, um, I think the Official Languages Act has in a generation eradicated socioeconomic disparities between francophones and anglophones is an incredible it's really it really is incredible perhaps unparalleled um, uh, work of legislation and if there was the the political will and if we were willing to deal with uh, the consequences right that 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 kind of policy doesn't come without uh, consternation without its challenges without groups uh, of, of people, including the, the dominant linguistic majority that did not like it. Um, and if we could do that kind of thing uh, for racialized minorities, yeah, you know, I, I think that it could be incredibly successful. Do you think that a country that is still, for the record, 77% white is willing to put those kind of changes in place, right? Do you think that a, a country that doesn't, where racial minorities do not have the, the, the political, uh, the kind of political entity that Quebec has emerged to be in this federation, right? Like with, with a concentrated, um, like Francophone majority population that can fight for its rights in, in uh, a federation predisposed towards recognizing uh, Francophone people's rights in the federation. Uh, and whereas racial minorities are, are dispersed across the country. Uh, and so that kind of concentration of, of, of political power doesn't exist in the same way. Only, you know, at the municipal, at the municipal level, which are creatures of the provinces anyway, and so that power is diluted. Um, in, in my most recent book, I actually write about, like, Quebec as being a success story in, in many ways, right? The idea that uh, a, a minority group could could fight so so adamantly and so well to protect its identity and, and language in uh, an anglophone country. It's incredible, um, and I, it makes me wonder because in part my book is about you know blackness being black in both Canada and the U.S. It makes me wonder, knowing very well the history of the United States and the history of this country and the ways in which like we have you know, attempted to uh, expunge, expel, and eradicate you know, people of color, uh, it, you know, it makes me wonder what kind of world that my grandfather would have lived in, my father would have lived in, I would have lived in, my children would live in, had those same opportunities been available to us either in the countries where my ancestors are from, which is the U.S., or, or the one where we live now, which is Canada. And I think it's an open interesting question um, that and I like to think about it a lot. I think that uh, that model is, is, has been quite successful and has um, worked the way that it was intended. Yeah, the only thing I would do, I would add uh, <clears throat> to Deborah's response, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is that why, the question then becomes why has it, if it works to equalize um, Quebec incomes with the rest of the country, and if it has narrowed gender differences, why has it not worked in the case of racial economic inequality? 
because there's been much more stability in those. So Deborah's answer is basically that size matters, that large groups in the population are able to mobilize in ways which uh, have more force. So Quebec, Francophone Quebec, clearly mobilized in ways itself internally and also in terms of the relationship with the Federation. And over a generation, did the gap just disappeared. And women, the gap is narrowed. But that's also a very large constituency. And so uh, <clears throat> the, the reason, one reason why we've not seen more action may be the size of the community and the relative uh, lack of political clout of the communities involved. Um, but so that's one explanation. The other is it's just going to be tougher because Canadians are not comfortable using the language of race. They aren't comfortable with race, I think, targeted programming. It would, governments would have to be um, much more strategic about race than about gender. I mean, I think that's absolutely clear. Thank you. I, I, if thinking about the size of the minority, we could think also of <coughs> sexual minorities who here income is not involved, but rights are involved, and it's not a huge group. Uh, but it seems to me there are lessons to be drawn from uh, looking at different situations of categorical inequalities and seeing how they evolved over time. But now time for questions for, from the audience. Hi, my name is Michael Novak. And OK, yeah. Hi, my name is Michael Novak, and my question is, that we talk about racial economic equality and minorities that are involved in that sort of situation. But what are the underlying factors that produce that economic equality? Is it discrimination in the workplace, not getting the promotions? Is it access to education? Is it access to venture capital, for instance? So once you go granular on it, then maybe there's certain things we can do to, accept, to address those particular particularly barriers for them to actually succeed. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. So if you were going to try and decide which, what tools you want to deploy in this way, <clears throat> carrying out that kind of analysis would be critical. Um, I do think <clears throat> we shouldn't dismiss the idea that there is racial discrimination in the labor force. In fact, we know there is. Um, or, uh, Phil Oriopoulos and others have done resume studies, experiments, where they uh, send out resumes to employers which are equal, identical, except for the name of the applicant. And we know from the results of those experiments that employers do favor people with names which are um, <clears throat> more typical of the white uh, population. So um, clearly that's one of the issues. Um, that uh, one would have to be willing to tackle, which, and, and as, as uh, Deb said, the sort of employment, employment uh, equity legislation in this country is not our strongest tool in the toolkit. But you're right, maybe, and maybe some of those uh, interventions would be at the educational level. I mean, we haven't decomposed the origins of the economic differences. We've been interested in why has the com country not been more concerned about them? Why have they? Why have we not engaged more directly? I mean, yeah, I think we don't we don't answer that in this paper. Um, so my sense is the thing about systemic racism is it's systemic, <laughs> you know, like it, it really, really is. And we can use the example of of the criminal criminal justice system, which I call the criminal punishment system because there's very little justice being done, right? If you wanted to fund the police, which to be clear, I think we should absolutely defund the police. Um, that solves some issues and it leaves an awful lot of issues intact, right? Including the fact that most prosecutors, most crown attorneys in this country are white. Most judges are white. We have no data on what happens to racialized people, especially black people, especially indigenous people, <coughs> once they leave the the area of encounters with the police and enter the criminal punishment system until they enter jails or are incarcerated. We don't actually know how many are being overcharged and 
uh, out on, on parole or, or, or to have their charges dismissed. We have no, we have no data on that. Right? So like defunding the police, yes, we'll do some things, but like it will leave large parts of that system intact exactly as it is. And so we'll just see the perpetuation of the same issues. Right. And the same goes with, with education, right? Like we, we can change the curriculum all we want, but uh, that leaves a, a lot of things intact, in, including funding problems, including the fact that our schools are falling apart, including the fact that schools in, in neighborhoods where racial minorities live are, are worse that, than schools um, where in the, in the suburbs where white people live. Right. So this is the thing. It is, it is a, a it is a, such a multi-pronged problem that only a multi-pronged response has like a hope of dealing with it. Merci, uh, Daniel Bilan McGill. Hello, mm -hmm. uh, Keith uh, and Deb. Uh, nice. Oh, to where? Oh, there you are. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Daniel. You want me to? No, stand? no, it's okay. Um, and uh, nice to see you. And of course, I read this paper a while back when it came out, and I assigned it to my students, and they they really found it uh, very interesting. But they thought some students told me, "Oh, yeah, it's like political scientists. There is a lot of really ana criticism, and uh, they talk about agenda setting and so forth." But in terms of policy solutions, it's a bit on the light side in terms of, and we are IRPP here. So concretely, <laughs> uh, so concretely, in terms of policy solutions, what should we do? Let's say if you were to advise, say, the Trudeau government, right? Maybe you are already. I don't know. No, maybe. But if you were to advise the Trudeau government or provincial government, what are the first two or three things that should be done in, in, in order to not only move this onto the agenda, but really tackle racial inequality in this country? Thank you. It's a tough question, but I think it's, <laughs> it's my students who ask it. I, I'm just summarizing yeah, their yeah, question. Yeah, 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 Daniel, you're yeah. killing us. Um, OK, so let, let me start with one, one easy solution, and then I'll hand it to Keith for the hard things, because he's um, a senior scholar. Um, so I actually do a lot of consultations with the federal government, and I will tell you, they do not know what systemic racism is. Most of my consultations are talking to federal civil servants about what systemic racism is. Um, and I think we have an idea in this country that you know racism is when racists do racist things. Fair, because sometimes racists do. There are there are literal Nazis in this country. Let's just put that out there. Um, but systemic racism is the idea. I think, as Keith articulated quite well, that even if you had no racists in your system, you would still see racially stratified outcomes because the system itself perpetuates. Like these advantages for some and disadvantages for others. Um, so the first thing I would do is have the people who are making policy be acutely aware of the ways in which policies that appear to be universal, right, that have all of the auspices, uh, the, these egalitarian norms, may in fact be really bad for people who look like me. Okay, so no problem. Keith and I, don't I, agree I on that, and everything. that might be enough. And maybe I don't have to say anything. I, Daniel, you want something um, on top of that? I'm sure. Uh, I mean, I'm not. I think Deb's absolutely right. There is a large mindset shift in coming to grips with the fact that we do not, as Canadians, we do not like to talk about race. We do not like to use race as a category in analysis and design. No question, Deb's absolutely right. If we did that, if we got through that process, um, I'm, I'm personally convinced that the labor markets are the place to start. Uh, others will disagree, but I, I think one could do a lot by if we could get our significant and more robust set of policy tools around our labor markets and employment equity. That's where I would start. Deb might have a different choice. I think we should absolutely defund the police. You know, I'll fight with you all on it. I know many of you probably disagree, but um, we should absolutely take much of that funding and redistribute it in the areas, uh, especially around mental health uh, uh, that have been um, eroded over the past three decades. So we don't agree on no, absolutely no, no. everything. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, 
Oh, sorry. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Ray Williams. Uh, some really very interesting um, pieces I heard uh, this afternoon, so thank you for that. I look at the question that you'd set out at the very outset, and in fact, something you just said, Deborah, um, really reflects to my mind more so where the challenge is, which is at the policy level. Policies are being made, and as someone has lived um, in a couple of different places, what's quite evident is that way too often the policies being made impact so many, and there are people who should be at the table helping establish those policies that are impacting those communities, black communities, for instance, and yet they're not there. And so this is what I see here in Canada um, when I think about who might be actually establishing the policies. This is what I know in the UK, even though there's some changes there. It's quite evident in the US. And so we have a consistent theme throughout all of this, which is policies being made that are impacting people where those people have no say in how it should occur. So I think that's, you know, if we're talking about, you know, how do we address this thing, that's, I believe, where we need to start to address it. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And, and so to be clear, it's not just a matter of about representation. It's that um, when you have people at the table who have different life experiences, you can, you, you can think differently, the way that problems, problems become framed differently. Let me give you like a really, really quick example from, from my own life. So I used to work at the University of Oregon um, and I was talking with the Dean of Students. And so at the University of Oregon, when I said like, you know, there are literal Nazis out there, at the University of Oregon, they were like in my classroom. Um, Oregon's a very strange state. Uh, there is, you know, a strong um, white supremacist, you know, part of the population. I think that's very clear and not controversial to say. Uh, and so I was talking with the Dean of Students and I was like, cool, you know, if I have a violent student in my classroom, which sometimes happens, what, are, what do I do? What are my options? And she was like, well, you call campus police. And I was like, no, 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 no. That's, that's not a good option for me, given that the campus police in Portland State have recently shot someone. What, who looks like me? What's my, what are my options? What are, my, what are the policies that, that you have in place so I can be safe in my, in my workplace? And she, she didn't have an answer, but this is it. Had there been somebody at the table when they were making those policies, perhaps somebody black could have said like, well, you know, calling camp campus police isn't a great, it's not, it's not a great solution for us. It's not a great solution for black folks on campus. So what other alternatives could we put in place, right? It opens the realm of possible, of, of policy options, right? When you have people who can, who can contribute to the conversation based on different kinds of life experiences. Um, shall I go ahead? Yeah, uh, Olivier Jacques, University of Montréal. I want to bounce back on what uh, Danielle has, has said. First, I want to say that this was one of the most thought-provoking articles I read in Canadian politics in the last many oh, years. Oh, there you are. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, and um, uh, I, want, I want to hear you more about uh, social policy, uh, about what we can do to address these issues. I totally agree that it, it's, it needs a multifaceted approach. But if we were just thinking about social policy, um, I was thinking your data f uh, about poverty are, la are from 2015. And since then, we had the Canada ja Child benef Benefit. And I would expect that everything else being equal, it reduced poverty of racial mon minorities more than of the white population because it is a targeted policy <laughs> within a universalist framework, right? Every parent had the right to receive it, but if you're poor, you receive more. So in theory, if racial minorities are poor, uh, uh, it has been a policy that has reduced poverty among racial minorities more than, about, than among the, 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 the white population. Uh, and it is a policy that is framed universal, extremely popular, and that seemed to have reduced child poverty uh, quite a bit uh, in Canada. So isn't that uh, the strategy for targeting within universalism? So why don't I start on this one? Yeah. Um, you're absolutely right, and then I, I used child, the child benefit example uh, of one which um, benefited, no question it benefited, uh, racial minority families probably more than non-racial minority families in, in the country as a whole, reduced poverty rates. Uh, so you're absolutely right. It is interesting. Isn't it interesting that no one says that? 
interesting that, I mean, the, the government claims credit, but it doesn't claim credit for that. <coughs> so what does that tell us? So at the, st at the strict policy strategy, I think we could, you, know, you, could, you could push that envelope further and adopt similar benefits. Um, but I don't think we're going to push the uh, egalitarian package far enough to eliminate the problem on its own, or, uh, with, with that package alone. I think you would need more targeted benefits. And the, you're not gonna, it's going to be hard to do targeted stuff if you won't even claim that this <coughs> program helped racial minority families. And I wonder what, I wonder what would happen if you did claim that. You know, I wonder what would happen to support for policies. So, then. I mean, Deborah used the phrase uh, "reform by stealth." <clears throat> the the the, um, the idea of policy making by stealth was developed as a concept to help explain retrenchment in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, and it's quite it's striking to me. And here I'm deviating a little bit from the topic, but it's quite striking to me the extent to which I sense. Um, that uh, progressive policy making is increasingly by stealth in the, in, in the contemporary period. Um, governments are not celebrating this. We, the left is not celebrating the extension of social programming in the contemporary period. It's, it's, it's slightly bizarre. Um, I, I mean, given the amount of social policy expansion that's been going on, how little it seems to figure in, in public discourse, especially on the left. And I don't, I don't understand that. <clears throat> but that is a deviation from the topic of the day. We have time for question. Thanks very much. My name is Tari Ajadi. Um, I guess I'm at Queens, but I will be at McGill shortly. I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, and um, I'm a big fan of this article. One thing I'm really curious about is the role of intergovernmental relations um, in entrenching racial inequality in Canada. And I'll use Nova Scotia as an example. So Nova Scotia is somewhat unique in the Canadian Federation insofar as uh, the vast majority or about 80% of its black residents in particular are three generations or more in the province, right? Many of whom have a, a relationship to the province going back 400 years. In Nova Scotia, we have distinctly race-conscious public policy. They released a policy document last year, the Countess Inn uh, document, uh, addressing the decade for people of African descent. They have an office in the provincial government that explicitly addresses, uh, the, it's the Office of African Nova Scotian Affairs. And you have something similar at the municipal level in Halifax as well. We're still seeing many of these inequalities not many, all of these inequalities being addressed, in part because, from my perspective, there is a tendency in areas of shared responsibility to pass the buck um, and to obscure, perhaps, uh, many of the ways that, in mm -hmm. fact, there has been race-conscious policymaking over the past uh, 50, 60, 70 years in ways that have actually entrenched and deepened those inequalities as opposed to removing them. So I'm just curious to know what your thoughts are on the ways that the different levels of governments might play a role in this kind of entrenched racial inequality. Yeah, I mean, wildly. One of the, the weaknesses of this paper is that we, we really do only look at the federal level. We, um, in spite of working on this paper for eight years, we, uh, we didn't have time to look at the provinces. <laughs> we're, um, we're really fast. We are, we are. This paper is older than my oldest child. Um, but like we, we, then that's a huge weakness of the papers because a lot of this work is happening at the level of the provinces. Certainly municipalities are quite important and we're really only looking at kind of federal, federal level um, stuff. But I'm thinking in particular um, these days about healthcare, right? And the, uh, other areas of, of provincial responsibility which are so crucial um, to alleviating or aggravating all forms of economic inequality. And that's a... Uh, Maybe if I could convince Keith to do another book, we'd, we'd get there. But he's, yeah, he it, tells me he's retired, so. So, so um, uh, Rick, let me, let me um, <clears throat> say, I, 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 I'm sure, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of Alain over here, uh, 
I'm sure federalism is a constraint. I, I, and I think the employment equity area is a very clear example. We're getting real progress require coordination um, at uh, across levels of government and there are no obvious levers. It's not a, you, know, you can't imagine a, a shared cost program where the federal governments could, uh, could in effect buy a provincial agreement. So I, I don't have any uh, um, reservations about that kind of argument. It would be specific to particular policy instruments, but I'm sure it's the case. Um, if I had to pick one aspect of our political institutions, which I think is important here, I don't think it would be federalism. I think it would be the over-representation of rural areas in our electoral system, which translate as serious under-representation of cities where racial minorities live. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you, you may, you, maybe you want to have a, a one last word, uh, or or that was it. Do you want a one last Deborah? word? Congratulations, boss. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, the things that she thinks the IRPP can uh, offer that unique voice, that voice that no one else is providing to policymakers, to academics, to students in our uh, educational in institutions. So France, on behalf of this board and all the other boards you've worked with, you've outlived a lot of us. Uh, in fact, it's it, for me, it's uh, sad. Trade de soleil to uh, see you leave us, but uh, I know that the work you've done, the excellence of that work, uh, has changed public policy for the better in this country. I know your work isn't quite done, uh, and in fact, you will continue to impact the public policy debate in this country. So I think with that, J'envie maintenant France de prendre la parole et de peut-être partager quelques réflexions sur ces 30 ans à IRPP. France, over to you. Oh, wow. <rire> J'ai pas très bien dormi hier soir. <rire> euh, en essayant de me préparer pour, pour tout ceci, mais je suis, euh, je suis quand même dépassée par, par les événements. Uh, thank you so much, Anne. Um, je voudrais commencer par dire un gros merci à Jennifer uh, d'avoir organisé ce superbe événement et à Suzanne Ostigui McIntyre et Juni Manny qui ont mis les bouchées d'eau pour s'assurer que tout irait, se déroulerait euh, parfaitement aujourd'hui. À vrai dire, je n'aurais jamais pu imaginer une meilleure façon de fermer, pour moi de fermer la boucle. Je suis bien heureuse de pouvoir partager ce moment avec, euh, avec mes enfants, Nicolas, Élise et, et Lachlan, avec mon conjoint Brian, euh, mes collègues euh, anciens et nouveaux, plusieurs amis et collaborateurs de longue date qui sont ici aujourd'hui, et même euh, un de mes anciens professeurs qui devait venir et qui a été obligé d'annuler à, à la dernière minute. J'aurais bien aimé le, me le voir, mais c'est qui m'enseignait en, en maîtrise à l'Université de Montréal euh, en 1975, alors, euh, et, et il travaille encore. <rire> C'est François Bayanco, Monique. Euh, je suis très touchée par votre présence aujourd'hui, euh, et je vous en remercie infiniment. Euh, et je vais passer, je vais m'exprimer en anglais pour, pour nos visiteurs, si, si vous me permettez. And thank you, uh, Keith and, and Deborah. Merci, Alain, uh, for your thought-provoking presentations and for doing this today. Uh, I've worked with uh, Keith and Alain on numerous projects over the year. I've always had enormous respect and affection for them. So it makes this all the more special. So thank you so much. Merci beaucoup d'être ici aujourd'hui. As I said, I could not have imagined a better way for me to sign <coughs> off after all these years by discussing a topic of fundamental importance for the future of the country that brings into question many of the framework policies of the country for the future of the country uh, policies that we've put in place over the past several decades and tried, not always successfully, to adapt to changing needs. As Keith and Deborah observed in their earlier work, ethnicity, culture, language, and identity, not race, have been the dominant understandings of, of our of differences. And as a result, Canadians have been uncomfortable uh, with the language of race. That's so true. Canadians uh, are uncomfortable with the language of race. And uh, yet that's precisely for this reason that we need scholars like them to take a step back, to look at the evidence, and to provide sober analysis of the dynamics at play. It is by engaging with their work and that of others with perhaps different views that we might find ways to get off the beaten path and the policy dead ends that have prevented us from making genuine progress on fundamental issues like the need to improve the lives of indigenous peoples and communities, for example. In more than 30 years with the IRPP, I've come to truly appreciate the enormous contribution to policy development made by Canadian ac academics working on Canadian issues with Canadian data. It's always been the role and the mission of the IRPP to facilitate this process and to help researchers disseminate their results and ideas to the policy community. I'm incredibly proud to have been able to take part in this uh, mission. 
when I was asked why I remain at the IRPP for so long, and I've been asked, <laughs> my, reply is that my, my reply has always been simple. It's because I learn something new and important every day. And plus, I get to work with the brightest minds in the country, and many of them are in this room today. I feel very privileged to have had this unique opportunity, and I'm grateful for the sense of accomplishment that I feel today. Um, I, uh, yes, I'm very grateful to many, yes, for this sense of accomplishment. I particularly want to thank Monique Jérôme Forget for hiring me as her first research director in 1992 and for naming me vice president research in 1998, a position that she created. Merci, Monique, for seeing in me an ability that I was not yet aware of <laughs> at that time and for handing me one of the best policy jobs in the country. <laughs> I also want to thank the other presidents I've served under, Hugh Siegel, Mel Cap, Graham Fox, and Jennifer Ditchburn for giving me their trust and support and for making the IRPP such a place to be proud of. I also want to thank board members, past and present, for their sage, always sage advice and invaluable insights. To all my colleagues, past and present, merci de votre camaraderie l'esprit d'équipe et votre dévouement remarquable au travail que nous faisons. And to all uh, IRPP contributors that I've had the pleasure to work with over the years, thank you for entrusting us with your research and your ideas for improving the lives of Canadians. During my time as VP Research, I've witnessed firsthand the importance of the Institute's mission. It's focused on independent, rigorous, policy research, and letting the evidence speak for itself. The, the Institute has a unique role in Canadian civil society that is more valuable than ever amid all the chatter and the noise and the Twitter feeds. I'm so happy to still be here to celebrate the IRPP on its 50th anniversary and wish Jennifer and the entire team every success in setting a productive course for the next 50 years. Merci infiniment tout le monde d'être là aujourd'hui. C'est un grand plaisir et je suis très émue.